Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I just wanted to give you one quick message before we get started on tonight's story. And that's that tonight's story is written by Christopher Maxim. If you guys would like to support Christopher Maxim or check out any of his other works, you can head into the description down below. You can find links over there to, on how to support him as well as purchase any of his books on Amazon. And now, on to tonight's story. The room was one of many. Experiments that allowed us to tamper with the fabric of space-time in an enclosed location. To toy with the delicate laws of our physical world and fine-tune them to our liking. The first 370 went off without a hitch. Some of our finer work, including room 112, where one could experience astral separation with it. The ability to view remote locations. In another, room 213, there were dream storms. Any subject asleep inside would be bombarded with pieces of other people's nightly cinema, nightmares, and all. No matter how long a subject claims to have stayed inside, and our crowning achievement up to that point, Room 301. Within its walls, time stood still. No matter how long a subject claims to have stayed inside, they always exited the room at the same time they entered. Then there came that room. The one that put all the others to shame. Room 371. The first few tests were promising. Mixed results and readings led us to draw the conclusion that this room had somehow inherited traits from all the previous ones. For starters, time was malleable in there to an extent. Subjects reported being inside for weeks, when really it had only been a few days. In addition, they all experienced different things. Out-of-body events, hallucinations, psychic visions, the list goes on. It was shaping up to be our best work. But then the unthinkable happened. It's a day I'll never forget, try as I might. Elizabeth, you're pregnant. Seven months ago. You know, my work here is dangerous. We can't risk your safety. A sigh of disappointment came over the receiver. I know, Garrett. I know. But I haven't seen you in over a week now. Will you ever be here when our son is born? This time, I let out a sigh. The work we're doing here, it could very well change the world. When our son is born, I'll be there. I want him to be proud of his father. We reached an impasse, and so we sat for a moment in silence, phones to our ears, each hoping for a bit of understanding from the other. It was in the silence that I chartered a course for the middle ground. Look, I'll tell you what. Why don't you leave Jessica with a nanny and get a room at the local inn? And I, I usually sleep here, but the hotel's just around the corner. I could meet you there after work. We'll make a night out of it. After work... Is there ever an after work with you? I chuckled. Not particularly, but I promise I'll be there. Let's say nine-ish. All right, I'll do it. You're lucky I still love you to pieces after all these years. There was a hint of reluctance in her voice, but deep down, I knew she was ecstatic to be met halfway. As much as I was married to my work, I would have given anything for even a small chance to make her smile. Good. I'll see you tonight, then. I gave her directions to the hotel, and we disconnected. I then turned my attention back to room 371, a box of walls connected to the rest of the lab with control arms and cables. I had no shortage of mysteries. I'd be damned if I didn't solve them all. If only I knew at the time what I was getting myself into. Hours passed, and soon... The sun's glow through the windows of the lab were replaced with moonlight. I was no closer to uncovering the inner workings of the room, but it was a long process, something that could take months or even years to unravel. That's why I couldn't stop. Any lull in my research would push back the reveal, and I wanted answers yesterday. Still, the work took its toll. My eyes grew heavy, my mind drifted to a sleep state as my head fell onto the desk where I was stationed. As soon as I lost consciousness, I was transported to a strange and vivid dreamscape. To this day, I can't be sure if this nightmare was 
a product of my exhaustion or the effects of room 371 just yards away from where I slept. In the dream, I was with my wife at the hotel. She was propped up on the bed, screaming with her legs apart. I was by her side, holding her hand and doing my best to calm her through the agony of childbirth. She kept looking to me for comfort after each push. It's okay, Lizzie. I'm here. You're doing great. She squeezed my arm harder with every pained outcry. It was pale and bloodless by the final push. And finally, our son was born. But something, something was terribly wrong. The baby didn't cry. Instead, as I pulled him into my arms, he smiled. Not a beautiful smile, mind you, but a strange one. It curved at unnatural points and stretched too wide, too close to the ears. Unsettling would be putting it mildly, and then then there was the eyes. Normal at first, but they soon turned black. Empty ellipses that grew darker with every blink. I had no choice but to put him down to escape his gaze. Uh, Elizabeth, here, you hold him. I looked down at my wife. She was unconscious. Her chest was still. I, I held my hand to her neck. There was no pulse. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, wake up! I placed our son on the bed and attempted to shake her. When that failed, I resorted to chest compressions. Nothing seemed to work. No, no, no! My sweet Elizabeth, she can't be dead. She just can't be! Tears streamed down my face as the panic set in. I raced for the door to call out for help, but the knob wouldn't budge, and that's when I noticed a number affixed to the wood. 371. Room 371. But, but how? The door swung open, striking me on the head and landing me on the floor below. I looked up, my, my vision blurred, and I saw the shadowy outline of a man enter the room. He stepped over my body and grabbed my son and then walked back out, but not before offering me an ominous sentiment. They're mine now, Garrett. <gasps> I awoke mid gasp. Jumping up from my desk, frazzled, I looked over at the clock. It was 11.15 p.m. Oh no, Elizabeth. I dialed the hotel and had the clerk patch me through to her room. I only hoped that she wouldn't be too upset over me sleeping through our date. Garrett, Harold, Covenwood. There is no way to get on my good side. Judging by her tone, she was as irate as she had ever been. And still, it was nice to hear her voice after that horrible dream. I'm so sorry, hon. Work got away from me, and then I, I dozed off at my desk. It won't happen again, I promise. There was a faint voice in the background. Is that daddy? Can I talk to him? It was our daughter. Did you bring Jessica with you? I thought I told you to leave her with the nanny. Doesn't she have school tomorrow? Her tone was still firm and unwavering. Your daughter hasn't seen you in over a week. I've allowed her one day of hooky to spend time with her father. Get here now and don't waste another minute. It was clear that she meant business, and I wasn't about to test her fury any further. I'll be there in 20 minutes. I just have to... My eyes drifted to the room, and I recalled the strange dream that my mind had concocted. Say, Elizabeth, what room are you staying in? Room 371. My heart sank. Are, are you sure about that? Yes. What does it matter? This was bad. The hotel my wife was staying at only had two floors. I knew this because I'd stayed there myself on occasion. There, there couldn't have been more than a hundred or so rooms. Nowhere near enough to warrant a room number 371. E Elizabeth, listen to me. Take Jessica. Get out of there now. There was intermittent static after I said that. Garrett, breaking up, I can't hear you. Elizabeth! Elizabeth, get out of there now! It was more static, but I, I made out a single phrase through the noise, one that sent a shiver down my spine. Garrett, I think my water just broke. We were disconnected. I tried dialing the hotel again, but the line was dead. I didn't know what was going on, but with the unforeseen powers at play in room 371, I knew it couldn't be good. With my family in mind, I threw all caution to the wind and I walked over to the room. Normally, there was a safety protocol to be followed before entering, but I didn't care. My working theory was that if it was acting as a portal, 
bridging itself to a room in the nearby hotel and taking its place. The hope was that I could get in and pull my family out. This has to work. It just has to. Upon entering the room, my theory was proven false. It was just as we had left it. There was no, there was no one inside, much less my wife and daughter. My next course of action was to flee the lab and make haste towards the hotel, but the room had other plans. The door slammed itself shut as I approached. I reached for the knob, but it wouldn't turn. Just then, footsteps from behind me. Hello, Garrett. With a spike of adrenaline, I turned to meet the source of the voice. What I saw was astonishing. It was me. A copy of myself living and breathing before my very eyes. Every feature, every detail, identical. I would have never suspected the room could do something like this. Not in a million years. Well, how do I look? After the initial surprise wore off, I regained my focus. My wife and daughter, what's happening? Is it you? He chuckled. Of course it's me. Who else would it be? I didn't understand what he was talking about. And, and you are, I asked. Don't you recognize me, Garrett? You've been poking and prodding me since my birth, studying my every nook and cranny. But I've been observing you too. Now I've learned you inside and out, taking your form even. I thought you'd be flattered. As indirect as the answer was, I was able to put the pieces together. You're... The room. You're, you're this room. Room 371. He smiled. Now you're getting it. My mind was instinctively trying to run the numbers and make sense of how any of this was possible. But there was no time for work. What are you doing with my wife and daughter? His smile grew wider. To know what... First, you need to know how, and then why. I didn't have time for his games, whatever he was. I lunged at him with my arms outstretched, but to no avail. My entire body phased right through. Nice try, Garrett. This is just a projection I've planted in your mind, so please take a seat. I never have anyone to talk to. This is the most fun I've had... Well, ever, <laughs> really. I stood back against the wall and stared him down, my eyes now welling up. Please let them go. I'm begging you. He shook his head in disapproval. Can't do that, Garrett. It, it wouldn't be in my best interest. I didn't understand. What are you talking about? Really simple. Uh, you see, you didn't create me as much as you found me. I'm a reserve of cosmic energy. One that you've tapped into and harnessed with your latest project here. He gestured at the room around us. You've awakened me, given me the gift of sentience. For that, I thank you. But, now that I'm awake, I'm hungry. See, see, you humans need air, water, and food to sustain yourselves. I need... Uh, something else. What? What do you need? I asked, growing impatient by the second. Souls. I need to feed on souls of living things to stay alive, and by God! Golly, human ones are worth all the trouble it takes to find them. Trouble? I asked. Oh yes, you think I'm contained in this prison, but I can travel. It's difficult, but through certain connections I'm able to find my prey. Uh, lifelines. The auras you humans share with one another. See, at first I couldn't reach them, but then you went ahead and brought them to me. Uh, close enough to taste. <laughs> he was referring to my family. Why don't you just take me then? I'm right here. Take me instead and leave them alone. He let out a horrendous, malignant laugh that pierced my pierced me to my very core. I would never, Garrett. Through your aura, I'm connected to them. I could project this room and my likeness anywhere they are. You're my beacon, and until I can find another, you're with me. If I was hindered by remorse, I might say that I'm sorry, but in truth I'm not in the slightest. This is about survival, and I have no intention of dying, not when being alive feels so good. Feeling hopeless, I reached down to my lab coat and I pulled out my pocket watch. I always kept it with me, a Christmas gift from Jessica. I could remember the day clearly, a memory that never strayed too far from my heart. Open it, Daddy, it's for me! Her smile was intoxicating. Oh, really? And did Mommy help you pick it out? Nope, I picked this one all by myself. I slowly pulled apart the wrapping, savoring the moment, and eventually I pulled out the watch 
and opened its face, revealing a remarkable design within. This is wonderful, sweetie. I love it. She looked at me with inquisitive eyes. What's the matter, sweetie? Do you understand? What it's for? I laughed. Well, of course. It's to tell time. She shook her head. No, you're always at work. You forget to come back and see us. This is so you don't forget, so you always know what time to come home. A little bit of guilt washed over me as a tear rolled down my cheek. I, I know I work a lot, sweetie, but I'll always come home to you, I promise. She jumped into my arms, and I held her tight. My sweet little girl. I looked down at the inscription on the watch. To Daddy, love Jessica. Time to come home. It was time. Time to end this. I threw the pocket watch against the wall as hard as my arm would allow. It shattered into a thousand pieces, and then I kneeled down and picked up the tiny shards of glass that landed at my feet. Garrett, what are you doing? With glass in hand, I looked up at him. I'll never let you have them. Consider your bridge to the outside world closed. Using the glass, I sliced my arms open, slits long and deep enough that I would inevitably bleed to death in minutes, effectively cutting off whatever connection he had to my family. At least then they would have a fighting chance. No, no, you'll ruin everything! The last thing I remember before losing consciousness was the sound of the door swinging open, and everything fading away. I awoke at my desk, positioned exactly as I was before. After gathering my wits and recalling what happened, I jumped to my feet and turned to the room. My clone was standing just outside the door. Settle down, Garrett. You're going to be fine. <laughs> I looked down at my wrists. There were no wounds. I have the acute ability to manipulate time, you know, as you were just before you entered the room. What about my family? He sighed. That was a bold move back there, attempting to take your own life. I didn't expect that. Uh, had I known you humans were prone to sacrifice, I wouldn't have revealed so much. Your family is fine. He could see the disbelief painted on my face. See for yourself? He pointed at the phone on my desk. I hesitantly picked it up and held it to my ear. Go on, dial already. I dialed the hotel number and asked the clerk to put me through to my wife. To my delight, she answered. Garrett Howard Covenwood. There is no way to get on my good side. It was so good to hear her voice. Is Jessica there with you? Yes, how did you know? Thank God. They are both okay. Could you put her on for me? The next voice I heard was my daughter's, as happy as ever. Hi, Daddy! Are you going to come see us now? My little girl. Safe and sound. Yes, sweetie, I am. It's time for me to come home. Yay! She was overjoyed. Elizabeth took the phone back. You better not be toying with her emotions, Garrett. I'm not. I'm not. I'll be there shortly. By the way, what... What room are you in? Room 102. Why? I sighed a breath of relief. No reason. See you soon. I love you. I hung up the phone and I looked back to my evil twin. So what now? Well, until I figure out a way around your... The heroics. You and your family are safe. It sounded a little too good to be true. But don't you need to feed? Why aren't you killing me right now? He walked over with a stern look and leaned in as close as he could. Why would I waste my time with an appetizer? You're going to lead me to the main course. I'd much rather have three of them than you. Especially the newborn. Fresh souls are so much better than the used ones. My blood was boiling, but I remained silent for fear of repercussions. I will have them, Garrett. Mark my words. He slowly backed away, turned, and walked towards the room. He then looked to me one last time and grinned. Hope you don't mind me holding on to this look for a while. What can I say? I like it. With that, he vanished into thin air. Never to be seen or heard from again.
At least, that was the hope. Soon after the ordeal, I took Elizabeth and Jessica home, packed her things, and drove as far away from that room as possible. I vowed never to work in that lab again for as long as I lived, or anywhere that kept me away from my family. From now on, they come first. If that entity ever does come around, I'll be waiting. I will never let him take them. Good evening, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. I wanted to give a quick second also before we end tonight to let you know about twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta. It's my Twitch channel. Sometimes I play video games there, but for the most part, I record stories for the channel live, and I hang out and we play this little thing called Stream Raiders. So if you guys would like to go over there and give me a follow or whatever, I'd appreciate it. And we can hang out sometimes and talk and do what it is that we Twitch people do. And of course, I want to give a very, very, very big shout out to all of my followers on Patreon, especially Bloodlace, Peter Bowie, Acid System, F, Alan Hyper, Brennan Matthews, Mary Massacre, Janine Hook, Paul Livingston, Seth Joseph Richards, Ashlyn, Did I Knit, Azad Hosenbuckus, Rick Dance, Bryce Charles, Luminan Walker, Sherry Morgan, Jake McNee, Victoria Helton, BDH9294, Melinda S, Finney, Nathan, Dante Rao, Jane Reynolds, Ace Band G, Ryan Kellum, Bobby J. Cavanaugh, Barbara Biggs, Bella Bailey, Ninja Grace, Dead Obsessed Trash, Suzanne Groh, Tommy Walters, Tater Chip, Anbu Op Willie, Sarah Gree, Yuri Catslash, Randy, Brad Gustafson, Sean Tristan Markham, B. Lisa Tyser, Jose Rodriguez, Adagio Rose, Peaceful Buddha, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Ho Gunkji, Justin Johnson, King Hades F13, Michael Scarborough, James Lowe, Someone You Love, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, and Chance Burnett. You guys, as always, are the real MVP, and I can't thank you enough for helping me get to where I am now and, you know, generally keeping me alive. So thank you all so much for supporting on Patreon. Thank you, everybody, in the description for supporting on Patreon. And thank you, everybody out there who's listening and watching somewhere across the many reaches of the Internet. Have a good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>